So hey, it's Jordan, Ancient Leadership Dude, and I want to talk about Final Fantasy today. Not just any Final Fantasy, the one, the only, the original, Final Fantasy for the NES. The only one that doesn't need any further number or subtitle. It came out on the Famicom in Japan in 1987 and on the NES in North America in 1990. And I played it growing up, played the heck out of it, loved it. It was a huge influence on me, as I've discussed before on the channel. And I want to talk today about why I think it's so underappreciated and overlooked and what about it, especially about its story, was so unique and distinctive that it obviously spawned the mega popular series that Final Fantasy has become today. And I'm going to be talking about three major reasons, and I'm going to list them here and then go into greater detail. Uh, the first of which is that I think the game is very deliberately archetypal and mythic in its presentation. Uh, the developers were obviously playing on especially Western ideas of medieval fantasy, and they didn't simply play on them, they subverted them, which leads to some of the other reasons. The second of which is that the game and its plot are very elegant, very simplistic and straightforward, easy to pick up and understand on a surface level. But leading into the third reason, they also have a surprising amount of depth. And a lot of that is because the game is called Final Fantasy, but as many of you know who've played the series, it's not simply about fantasy. And this game in particular really introduced that fun science fantasy element, that technological underpinning that sort of lies under the surface of the seemingly fantasy atmosphere of the game. And I want to talk about these three things and why, in my mind, they really turned into one of the greatest games ever made. So, as I said, the game takes a very particular tone right from the beginning. Uh, it comes out of the gates swinging. From the moment you turn the power on, in fact, you're treated to that wonderful NES Final Fantasy prelude music, and a text scroll appears. Very impressive looking for its time text scroll. And it takes the form of a prophecy, which is of course very mythic and legendary in feel and the prophecy runs thus the world is veiled in darkness the wind stops the sea is wild and the earth begins to rot the people wait their only hope but prophecy when the world is in darkness four warriors will come after a long journey four young warriors arrive each holding an orb so as you can see, from the very beginning, from the very outset, the game is setting forth its own sort of mythology. Uh, it makes us aware that the game's world has its own history and set of beliefs and uh, a form of prophecy that it's looking to the future, uh, much as our own world would and, and much as we would expect to find in our own mythology and, and legends. And uh, this trend you know, continues, of course, as the game goes forward. Uh, when the game actually begins, uh, you as the four light warriors set out and discover that uh, the princess has been kidnapped, as you might expect. You've got a, a damsel in distress. Uh, so Princess Sarah has been taken by Garland, who uh, is a, a kind of a knight errant. He's a really a traditional uh, black knight who, for some unknown reason, has gone rogue. And he's taken her to a place called the Temple of Chaos. And... This will become significant for several reasons going forward. So again, right from the outset, you have the game very deliberately playing on archetypes. You have four light warriors, four crystals, representing the four classical elements, really. Uh, there's no other way to put it. Uh, earth, fire, water, and air. And beyond being almost universally recognized as the four, or in some cases five, uh, fundamental forces of the world. Uh, the number four is very significant in Western thought, especially uh, in Jungian psychology and in mythology in general, for representing order and balance and stability. And of course, that's significant here because those four things, these four elements have come out of balance and are potentially causing the world to fall into ruin. And all these sort of easily recognizable mythic tropes only continue to be developed in the game. You have a pirate who has besieged a, a small port city. You have uh, 
an elf prince who has fallen into an unnatural slumber, and the only way to awaken him is to retrieve a crown for a dark king who gives you a crystal to restore the sight of a witch who gives you an herb to awaken the prince. Uh, and those are sort of the introductory uh, elements of the story. And after that point, the, the real main plot begins to kick off. And that's when you get into uh, what are called the Four Fiends. And these fiends are one of my favorite parts of the game. They are the personification of the imbalance in the world. Uh, they are the uh, forces that represent the imbalance of the, the four classical elements. Uh, you have the undead lich of the earth, the fiery merolith of the fire, the kraken of the water, and Tiamat of the air. And uh, they function somewhat like uh, mythological antagonists. They serve as gatekeepers. Uh, they wait at the threshold and they guard the uh, pedestals which will restore light to the orbs that you carry. And Again, in that way, they function in much the same way that, say, Argos would in Greek classical myth. Uh, they're, they're guardians. Uh, again, they're gatekeepers. And even beyond the main characters and primary antagonists, you have a game filled with monsters from folklore and mythology. It runs the gamut from imps to ogres to wizards and sorcerers to wyverns and manticores. Uh, monsters and figures that derived from various mythologies all across the world uh, and it even has dinosaurs I mean you can run into uh, T-Rexes and Ankylosauruses which is pretty wild uh, it threw me for a loop as a kid uh, but it's great right you know when you can fight dinosaurs with swords and axes and stuff uh, all of these elements are very easily recognizable they're fun uh, if you've ever cracked open you know a, a fantasy book or if you've ever read any mythology, something about all of it is going to appeal to you and, and you're going to immediately recognize it. Okay, so getting back to my second point, the elegance and simplicity of the story. The game doesn't have named main characters. You provide the names for the characters. They're blank slates. Uh, you have four of them. You choose their uh, class and so essentially you customize and choose your own party, which is sort of neat from a gameplay perspective, but uh, it also has story implications. And what it means in terms of the story is that it creates, of course, some distance between the player and the, the main characters. It puts the focus on the story itself and the elements of that story. We don't have any inter-character dialogue, which, of course, could arguably be a good or a bad thing. I would argue that in this case, it's a good thing because the game, Final Fantasy, is about its main story. It's about this unfolding saga. Uh, it's about not even good versus evil. It's about a sense of balance in nature. And I don't think that a bunch of witty banter between warriors and wizards and thieves would have really furthered that plot along. Um, I think that sometimes this is a trap that modern JRPGs fall into when they feel the need to have identifiable characters and these characters themselves can fall into easily recognizable tropes and, and cliches and stereotypes and to my taste it often simply doesn't work it's it's overreaching it tries too hard and as a player a lot of that dialogue chews up a lot of playing time uh, it just physically takes a lot of time to scroll through it and Again, as a player, sometimes that obscures uh, the, 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 the gameplay for me, but it also can obscure the main story, which is one of the most important things about uh, specifically a JRPG for me. So getting back to the main point about the elegance and simplicity of the story, it has some pretty clearly recognizable elements, and it, it is essentially divided into pretty easily identifiable components or, or minor episodes or arcs, uh, beginning with the rescue of Princess Sarah to, again, the awakening of the elf prince and, and this sort of thing. Once the main plot really kicks in, it all becomes about that main theme of restoration. Restoring the balance of the earth at Melmond, uh, the, the volcano at Crescent Lake, onto the underwater temple at Onrak, and the air itself at the floating castle. Uh, 
All of which leads on to the very end of the game and the real struggle, which is with Garland and an attempt to restore the balance of time itself, which he has disrupted. Uh, this essentially is the real contention of the game. All of which leads to my final point, which is that for all of its elegance and immediate appeal, the game has a surprising complexity and it draws from places that we might not normally expect in a conventional fantasy story. And one of the principal things and identifying features about this in my mind is that it's a uniquely Japanese product. And I'm going to take a minute to backtrack and explain that because what I mean by that is that Final Fantasy as a game and, and in terms of its story is not exactly the cookie cutter, generic, westernized fairy tale that we might expect from more Western RPGs at the time. Uh, it was developed by storytellers who had a uniquely Japanese outlook and uh, that outlook is apparent in some of the symbolism and even the essentially numerology of the game. All of this gets at what I think is one of the most interesting features of Final Fantasy, both as a game and as a series, which is that unique cultural clash between East and West. Uh, and I think this is evident from the beginning of the game. Uh, the number four that is very clearly central to the game has a very different meaning in Western thought than it does in Eastern. Uh, again, in the Western world, it's associated with balance and order. In traditional Japanese culture, deriving from older Chinese traditions, the number four has a very different connotation. It's considered very unlucky and even ominous because it has a direct phonetic association with the word for death. And so the harmonious and beautiful crystal numerology in the beginning is paired up with these elements of imbalance and disorder and chaos that are personified by the four fiends, the fiends of the elements. So from the very beginning of the game, you have a worldview that doesn't exactly jive with Western views. You don't have a simple story of good versus evil. You have, in fact, a story of dualism, a kind of a cosmic dualism that you might expect to find more in Hinduism or Buddhism than in a Western myth or fairy tale. And this all dovetails with what I think is ultimately the theme of the game, which is that the world is not as simple as it seems. And this is evidenced, as I've said before, at the end of the game, where you have the concept of a time loop in which your enemy Garland returns to the past in order to trap you and defeat you from the past. It's more of a science fiction concept than you would expect to find in conventional Western RPGs at the time. But again, because of the nature of the game, I think it fits really well here. Uh, it's a bit of a head scratcher as most uses of time mechanics tend to be in popular fiction. It's been widely debated by fans and it's just sort of a, a fun discussion point, uh, you know, in its own right. But the main point that I want to make about it is that this time travel element, like so many of the other more science fiction elements of the game, whether it be uh, ancient robotic guardians or floating castles or, or airships or what have you are elements that are pretty unique to the Final Fantasy series. I think largely because they derive from outside of the mainstream Western fantasy storytelling of the time. It's obviously not that those elements didn't exist within fantasy. You had authors like Jack Vance and Gene Wolfe and probably others long before them who were exploring that intersection between fantasy and science fiction in written literature for some time. But in video gaming, to my knowledge, that that form of storytelling wasn't really common or certainly not hugely popular as the Final Fantasy series would make it from this point. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting thing in its own right. As a big fan of uh, f the history of fantasy and science fiction storytelling, I'm fascinated by that intersection uh, I think that the walls between fantasy and science fiction are thinner than most people realize. It's a big part of the reason why Star Wars is so popular and endearingly popular. And again, I think it's a huge part of what has made Final Fantasy as a series so hugely popular. So I want to sort of end it on that note. Uh, 
I've gone over the main reasons that I think the game worked. So in conclusion, I think that Final Fantasy brought something really new and fun to the world. Uh, and I think that for all its flaws, the JRPG as a genre itself is at its heart a really uniquely joyful and innocent exploration of everything that makes mythology great. And it kind of comes at it with fresh eyes because it doesn't just derive from one culture. It, it's looking at it in a more universal way. And uh, I, for one, am a big fan of the genre. Uh, again, for all of its flaws, uh, I find most of the JRPGs that I've played to be enjoyable and, and at least interesting in, in some way or another. So in any event, I hope that you've enjoyed this discussion. Uh, I know I tend to ramble a little bit, but I hope there's been some point of interest here and uh, I hope that you let me know what you think. Let's get a discussion started. And uh, in the meantime, I just hope that you take care as usual and I will talk to you later.